You know, I would say that um, in coming here this morning uh, to preach, I always wonder to myself whenever I'm visiting a church, what shall I preach? And just in praying to the Lord about it, I um, really came back to the text that I've been preaching through. We've been going through the book of Acts. And I believe that the very point in place that we are at in our series in Acts, I think would be very apropos for uh, you as a flock because as you consider your transitions um, as a church, I think it would be very helpful and important for you to think about the kind of integrity, the kind of character that you would want to have in a man who would oversee a church. Um, We have been looking at, in our series in Acts, we've been looking at very carefully the integrity of the Apostle Paul. And I've got to say that as I study this man and I study his life and I study the, the consistency of his character, I am amazed at the power of God's grace that could be uh, brought about in a frail and weak man like Paul. And frail and weak he was. In fact, it was the power of God that was manifested through his frailty and weakness. And by the way, that's not just true for Paul, that's true for anybody. In fact, frankly, we get in the way of the grace of God and the power of God when we think we can do better. And this is the example that I, this is this is what I love about Paul's example is the fact that he certainly understood that he was merely an instrument and his desire and design was to have God use him and that ultimately he could o- only serve God and give him glory if he was submitting to the will of God and the power of God. And so I would like to direct your attention to Paul's example. And the scripture reading that I just read this morning formulates the basis of what we're going to be studying this morning, although we're going to jump forward to Acts 20. But let me remind you of what Paul said after preaching and solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Remember that those who heard him resisted him and blasphemed, and it says that he shook out his garments and said to them the following, Your blood be on your own heads, I am clean. What does he mean? What does that mean to say, your blood be on your own heads, I am clean? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. Paul isn't saying, I am clean, as if to say that he was without sin. He understood that he was a frail and sinful man and called himself the chief of sinners. He's not saying he's sinless. What he's saying is very important. I want us to understand and distill what he is saying because What he is saying is really communicating his integrity as a minister of the gospel. So when he says, I am clean, uh, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean, what he is really doing is he is reflecting the truth of Ezekiel chapter 33, where the Lord commissioned Ezekiel to be a messenger and a watchman on his behalf to the nation of Israel. And so it says... Now as for you, son of man, this is in verse 7 of Ezekiel 33. Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. And then he says, but if on your part you warn a wicked man to turn from his way and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. Which is another way of saying you will be innocent of his blood guilt. I would submit to you that the language here is very clear. And it very much comports with what we see in Ezekiel chapter 33. When Paul said that their blood was on their own heads and that he was clean, what he was saying is is this, is that I have been a faithful watchman. I have preached and proclaimed the gospel. I have carried out my duty. I have warned you solemnly as God has commissioned me to do. And in your rejecting the truth, guess what? I can't take responsibility for that. That's on you. That's exactly what he's saying. By the way, he says it again in Acts 20, and that's why we're going to be in Acts 20 this morning, because he says much more about his integrity as a minister of the gospel in that text. But before I get to that, let me just say this. 
When you look at this text and you think about what Paul is saying, understand this, the duty of a, an under-shepherd, the duty, duty of the minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ has a very stark and serious responsibility and he represent, re- represents not men but God. So when he speaks forth the truth of God, he has to understand he is discharging a very important responsibility on God's behalf because it is God to whom he must answer ultimately. I was in the military for eight years and I'll never forget one of the early experiences that I had in basic training. We had, at, in the evening, in our barracks, we had a gentleman who had a stand guard at the door of the barracks every night. And we had to pull shifts in that duty. And we could not stand, we did not like doing that duty. Because every now and then, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, a, a technical instructor would come by, bang on the door, and try to get in through the door against the orders that were given to the watchman at that door. So the watchman was said, you don't let anybody in. And unless they give you a verifiable identification, you do not let anybody in. So one night, a technical instructor comes along. He flashes a badge. And what is it? It's a picture of Mickey Mouse on that identification card. The guy lets him in. And you know what they did to that guy? That watchman who failed. They didn't just recycle him back to the beginning of his training. They kicked him out. Does that seem a little severe? Maybe. But mark this, in wartime, the enemy will try to do more than just reduce your enlistment status. They'll change your living status. You know what I understand about the Apostle Paul, what we need to understand about the Apostle Paul is that he understood that we are at war. And that as a watchman, his responsibility to guard the flock of God, to preach and proclaim nothing but the gospel, was a serious and solemn duty and responsibility. And it is one that he did not have license to shrink away from. And as soon as I say those words, shrink back from, that then compels me to move a little bit forward. Because I want to expand upon what Paul is talking about when he says, I am clean. When he says that he was was innocent of their guilt, what he is really stating is more fully expanded when we get to this text when Paul is departing from Ephesus and he has a meeting with the elders there. And before he goes to Jerusalem, he describes and summarizes his ministry in their midst where he explains to them once again that he had carried out his responsibility as a faithful watchman. And so with that in mind, I'd like to ask you then to jump forward to Acts chapter 20. Because in this text, we're going to expand upon what Paul is talking about in his responsibility as a watchman. I just don't know how far I'm going to get in this sermon. We'll see. There there are five principles that I see in this text section of Scripture. Now we're in Acts chapter 20. We'll be in Acts 20 verses 18 through 32. Where number one, we see the humility of Paul, particularly in verses 18 and 19. He says to the elders that he came to them and ministered to them with humility and tears and trials, serving the Lord all the time. Then boldness, he describes in verses 20 through 23. He says that he did not shrink back from declaring to them anything that was profitable. That's another way of saying, you know what, I stood my ground. I preached what God called me to do. I didn't shrink back in fear. Number three, we see solemnity in the Apostle Paul. Twice he uses the word solemn to describe the manner in which he preached the gospel. Selflessness as well. This is our fourth point. Selflessness. Paul was a selfless minister of the gospel. He says this in verse 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. And finally, guardianship, which I doubt we'll get to. But it's here in verses, in verses 18 through 32 where Paul discharges his responsibility ultimately and warns the church Exhorting them to guard the flock of God, which was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the Apostle Paul. This is his character quality. He is a man of humility, of boldness, of solemnity, of selflessness, and a heart of guardianship on behalf of the flock of God. All of these qualities are very important. We're just going to summarize them very, very briefly here this morning. But let's consider these together because I think these are very important and they do communicate ultimately the nature of Paul's integrity as a minister of the gospel. Let's go back to the beginning of this section of scripture to Acts chapter 20 beginning in verse 18 where Paul talks about the humility that God had been bringing about in his life as he ministered the gospel. And he says this beginning in verse 18, and when they had come to him, 
He said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. As I said, four things he lists. His servitude, his humility, his tears, and his trials. All these things really characterize the nature of Paul's ministry. Now listen, if you've read through, I'm sure that you've studied through the the ministry of Paul and his missionary journeys and how it is that time and again, as he was preaching the word of God, he faced a great deal of opposition from those who heard him. And most recently, as we were studying in Acts 16, we saw that when he was at Philippi, what happened? Well, the city rushed upon him, beat him, threw him in jail, and nearly killed the man, he and Silas with him. Then they get to Thessalonica, they begin to have a ministry of the word and preaching the word of God in the synagogues, they get kicked out of there, they move on to Berea, and some Jews follow them there, agitating the crowd, so they had to leave from there, they had some ministry in Athens, they moved on from there, and in Corinth, what happens? Well, we just read it, they get some more opposition once again, and then by the time they get into Ephesus in the third missionary journey, Paul is preaching the word of God, there's, there's some who are responding, but then the entire city is agitated by his preaching, such that the entire city engaged in this worship of Artemis declaring for two hours over and over and over again great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Can you imagine being surrounded by that? And I think that what you have to understand with the Apostle Paul is, is that he was surrounded by people, pagans and Jews who wanted him dead. And you know what? That tells me a lot about the Apostle Paul. How many men would have opted out of this gig long before then? How many men would have said, you know what, this is too much. Um, I, I'm glad to serve the Lord, but you know what, this whole thing about uh, you know, being kicked out of cities, being beaten, being uh, whipped, being thrown into prison, all these things. Why endure this? How many men would give up? Paul didn't. This is why I love what he says when he talks about the nature of his ministry to, the, to the, the brethren there in Ephesus, that he came to them with servitude and humility and tears and trials. And what he's basically saying is, is that, you know what, by the grace of God, I ministered to you truly and from the heart and with the sum total of my life and being. This is no passing hobby, in other words. This is not just something that I do just because it's interesting. No, this was his life. You know, when I was in seminary, I was warned many times by many professors about the kind of trials that I may face in the ministry and that all of us men would face in the ministry. And there's something very clinical and academic about sitting in a classroom, hearing about trials and things like that, and nodding your head and saying, yeah, well, things may get rough out there, but until you go through it, It is a bit academic. And I've got to say that as a man who was saved at the age of 20, as a man who lived in the world and lived in much worldliness and saw a lot of dark and and very ugly things in my life before I was saved, I've got to say that nothing compares to the ugliness that I have faced just for preaching the gospel. And many times by religious people, just as Paul endured. The thing that I love about Paul is that his example was real. This wasn't some sort of a shallow guy who was just kind of a, a passing fancy and was just here now and then gone another day And because he was afraid of the ministry. No, he endured great hostility in his imitation of Jesus Christ. What a blessed example that is. You know, we in America, we really don't see this, do we? You know, just last weekend, uh, I was mindful of the fact that there was a church in China that tried to meet, and I don't know if you read the report, but uh, just for trying to meet, the police came, and I don't know what exactly they did to them, but it appears that they arrested them, put them in buses, and hauled them off. We don't know what happened. This is why whenever I begin a time of worship, I'm just, I have to remind myself what a privilege this is to to love the Lord, to serve him with his people. And it is too easy to take these things for granted. But Paul didn't take it for granted. 
And he was willing to pour out his own life for the sake of the ministry of the gospel. And this he did. And so he came and ministered with real tears, with real trials, and with real humility as a man who was broken before God and as a man who relied upon the power of his grace alone. What a great example that is. And so he ministered in great great humility and in great perseverance. Secondly, he ministered with great boldness in the truth. Beginning in verse 20 on through 23, look with me as I read aloud. How I did not shrink from declaring, as he describes his ministry, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now be Behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. He didn't have the details, but he knew that bonds and afflictions awaited him as he proceeded on to Jerusalem. What I love about Paul here is that we see his consistency and his boldness in preaching and proclaiming the truth, even bringing it to the people, going out to them publicly, not just from the pulpit, but house to house, bringing the scriptures to the people in every opportunity that he could. Why? Because he knew that his commission from Jesus Christ was to to feed the flock of God. He knew that that was his responsibility. And that as a messenger of Christ, that was his supreme duty. But notice the fact that he says, and he says it twice, here in verse 20, and then later in verse 27, he says, I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Again, he says, verse 27, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Now, why would he need to say that? Why would a man need to say, I didn't shrink back? That's another way of saying, you know what, I didn't give in to the fear of men, right? And that sounds easy to say, but let me tell you, giving in to the fear of men is, well, that's easy. It's too easy. In fact, I love what Paul says to the church of Galatia, a church that was really giving in to the fear of men and they were compromising the gospel, remember? And so he says, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. If I'm going to give in to the fear of men and serve men, then I'm no longer serving my master who commissioned me to this ministry. And that was Paul. And what did he preach? What did he not shrink back from declaring? Verse 20, anything that was profitable, what's profitable in in Paul's lexicon what is profitable uh, all scripture is inspired by God and is what profitable for teaching for reproof for correction for training in righteousness what was he preaching the word of God well that's what he says in verse 27 that he did not shrink back from declaring to them the whole bullying the whole purpose or decree of God in other words what what do we know about Paul he wasn't around just telling fanciful stories and little uh little little uh pseudepigraphal stories that might entertain people. No, he was preaching Scripture. Time and again, he was committed to preaching the Word of God. The fact that he did not shrink back indicates the fact that, once again, that he did not give in to the fear of men. Now, mark this. Mark this. That doesn't mean that Paul didn't struggle with fear. It's one thing to say, you know, I didn't shrink back. That's one thing to say that. But it's another thing to say, you know what, I did struggle. And I did have moments where I was afraid. In fact, if you go back to chapter 18, the Lord appeared to Paul in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Wow. The Lord had to tell him not to be silent? What does that tell you? That tells you that Paul in his heart was fearful. You know what that tells me? That tells me he's a mere man. I don't ever want to get to a place where we take these men and make them more than what they are. They're mere men. That's what they are. But that's the beauty of it is that we look at them and we see hope and we say, oh, look at the power of God's grace such that these frail creatures can actually be used for the glory of God. So that a man who's frail and who struggles with fear cannot give in to the fear of men and not shrink back from declaring all that is profitable. That was Paul. I know a number of men in the ministry who have struggled over these issues. I was told of a man, a dear friend, 
This is a friend of a friend. This man knows a pastor friend of, that I know in Pennsylvania. He was telling me the stories, the behind-the-scenes stories about what happened to this man who was ejected out of his church. What happened was is that this pastor learned about the fact that there was a missionary on their missionary board who was not preaching the gospel. He preached what is called baptismal regeneration, which says that, that the act of baptism is the thing that saves a person. That is works righteousness. That is a violation of the gospel. And so this pastor came to his elder board and said, man, I'm concerned that we have, we're supporting a missionary who actually teaches this. And instead of submitting to the word of God, they fired him. When I was told that story, I, <laughs> my first response was, that's good news. And the person who was telling me the story, they kind of, they looked at me like, what? And I said, you know what the good news is? He didn't shrink back. You know what the bad news would have been? Is that that guy said, you know what? I need to keep my job. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. That would have been bad news. I'm sorry that that happened. I'm sorry that that man ended up getting fired from his position. But listen, what I'm really sad about is the response of the leadership in the church. They didn't stand for the gospel. And they should have. And you know what? They bear that blood guilt. Not the pastor. I could go on. I've got men I know in the ministry and my own experiences. I won't wax eloquent on these things. I know a gentleman who, just for bringing up concerns about a book in a church, uh, a book that I share great concerns about too as well, uh, he just brought this up and said, you know, I'm concerned that we have this book in our church. It's gone six months. Another guy I talked to in Georgia a number of t years ago, I asked him, how's the ministry going? He said, well, everything's fine except for the fact that the church is suing me. I never heard that before. The church is suing you? Yes. So what are you preaching? He told me what he was preaching. You know what he was preaching? He was preaching the gospel. You know, when Paul told Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, mark this, that was not some theoretical concept of Paul. He knew what that was about. He tasted it. And that characterized his life in ministry, and yet he endured in boldness. And thank God for that boldness. Again, that doesn't mean he didn't struggle with fear. He did. But by the grace of God, he endured. You know, I admire men like that. I admire Paul. I look at a man like that, and I think to myself, you know, I want to be like that guy. More and more and more. And a church should want a man like that. The third point I want to bring up here is the sense of solemnity that Paul had. And not just Paul, but all of the apostles. Why am I using the word solemnity? Well, because Paul uses it twice in this narrative. In verse 21, he says that he solemnly testified to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in verse 24, he says that the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Twice Paul uses this word, dia maturamai in the Greek, to speak of the nature and characteristic of his preaching. It was done solemnly. Now, what does that mean? Some of your translations have the word testify, but I would submit to you that that's the word maturamai. Dia maturamai is an intensified version of that word. So we're talking about something that's a lot more serious, a lot more grave than just testifying. Yes, I mowed the lawn. That's, a testi that's testifying in a general sense. But this word is more intense, and it is really correctly translated as solemnly testify. Uh, it's translated as charge when Paul charges Timothy to preach the word in 2 Timothy chapter 4. That's the idea. This is serious, is the idea. Now, solemnity obviously doesn't mean that a preacher needs to be a court jester. We've got a lot of court jesters and entertainers today, men who are more concerned about making people feel good and feel happy and so forth 
Uh, obviously, it's not that, but neither is it someone who's just morose and, you know, there's uh, just everything's all bad and dark and so forth. And, and look, there's a great time and opportunity for humor in all of life. I remember when Spurgeon was teaching at his pastor's college, he said to the, the, the new and upcoming pastors the following, he says, men, when you speak of heaven, let your face light up. Let it be irradiated with heavenly gleam. Let your eyes shine with reflected glory. But when you speak of hell, well, your ordinary face will do. Now that's funny. And there's a great time and opportunity for humor, but mark this. When we look people eye to eye and we talk to them about the eternal state of men's souls and we talk to them about the difference between heaven and hell that endures forever, this is serious. When we talk to them about these grave matters, it's not a time for just joking around. And that's why in the book of Acts, nine times this word, diamotutamai, is used to speak of the nature and the characteristic of the apostolic preaching. They preached solemnly because they understood that this was the most serious message in the world. Perhaps some of you have heard about this book written by Rob Bell, Love Wins. He redacts and redefines the definition of hell and heaven. And basically, by the time you read through the book, you would come to the conclusion that, well, really, uh, if you die and you go to hell, uh, there's some second chance that you may have of actually getting back into heaven. He's actually teaching the same thing that C.S. Lewis teaches in his book, uh, The Great Divorce. That's why Rob Bell cites The Great Divorce at the end of his book as being his primary source for the doctrine of hell. That's the idea. You could go to hell, but you know what? You could, through this purgatorial process, get booted back into heaven if you decide to go back into heaven. Now, after reading a book like that, I would get the impression to say, well, you know what? Okay, well, if I die and go to hell, I can just just come back to heaven with a second chance. Really? You may not know anything about Rob Bell, but Rob Bell is basically an entertainer. And he's written a book about hell that basically is catering to the masses. What it is not is a solemn testimony about the danger that men face should they reject the gospel. By the way, that same word, diamatutamai, you know where else it occurs? It occurs in Luke chapter 16. Remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and how it is that the rich man died and when he was, when he was in torment in hell, he appeals to Abraham and asks for Lazarus to go and warn his five brothers and that's the word he uses. He says that they may, diamatutatai, warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. The rich man knew in hell that this is a serious message. Let them go. Let Lazarus go and warn my brothers because this is grave. It's a sad thing to think that the inhabitants of hell would make better preachers than some preachers that we have today because they understand that hell is serious. How much more should we as Christians understand that hell is serious? The apostles understood that this message of heaven and hell and the fact that Christ is our sole hope in this life, they understood that this is a solemn message. That's why they preached solemnly. And that's exactly what Paul was committed to doing. Imagine being on a ship and going to the edge of the ship and seeing down in the cold icy waters a frail body flailing around in the waters. What do they need? They need to be rescued immediately. Would that be a time for a, a joke? Maybe a little bit of goofing around, a, you know, kind of make it a, a jovial moment. You know what? If you saw somebody drowning in the waters, what are you going to do? You're going to just do everything you can to get them a lifeline. Mark this. Again, I don't want to overstate anything here, but I want us to understand that when we have an opportunity to talk to people about Jesus Christ, if there is one spirit and attitude that must be with us, it must be that this is serious. Because their souls are valuable. And woe be to us if we not value them and value the moment and value the gospel appropriately. So we see in Paul humility, we see in Paul boldness, we see in Paul solemnity in his preaching of the gospel. Fourthly, we see selflessness. 
But Paul was willing to lay down his life in this ministry of the gospel. And this is what we see in verses 24 through 27. Look with me as I read through the text. He says, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. There's our text. There it is again. And here's why. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. There it is again. Paul says, I have discharged my duty. I've been a faithful watchman. God has given me his word. I have dispatched that word. I have, I have sounded the call. I have warned you. I have taught you. I have instructed you. I have given to you what God has commissioned me to give to you. My conscience is clear. But what I love about this statement here in verse 24 is this. It shows the selflessness of Paul. He says, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, and here's the, here's the purpose statement, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus. First of all, this selflessness is, is so characteristic of Paul. He understood that his life was not his own, and so therefore this idea of pouring out his own life as a drink offering for Christ was his privilege. He knew that that was the case, and this is what he communicates in 1 Corinthians 6.20, where he says, For you have been bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body. You are not your own. You're not your own. If you're a child of God, guess, guess what? You're not your own. Your life is not for you, it's for the glory of God. And what a privilege it is to pour out that life for his glory. But again, the great disease to this principle is the fear of men. And the fear, of self, and the fear that is produced through the desire for self-preservation. There's always within us a desire to save ourselves, protect ourselves, make ourselves the most important thing. You know, I, I, what I love about what Jesus says to the disciples, he warns them about this danger of fearing men. And when we fear men, what that means is, is that we are no longer fearing the one who really deserves fear, and that's God. So Jesus enjoins his disciples and says, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He deserves our fear, not men. I love that. It's another way of saying, I got good news for you. They can kill you, but that's all they can do. If your soul is in Christ, here's the good news. They can't, they can't take that away from you. Satan can't take that away from you. All of the forces of evil cannot rob your soul. That is in the hands of Christ, if you are Christ's. And so because of this attitude... Paul was able to carry out his mission. And that's why he was able to say, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. This is reflective of what he says in Acts 18. Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. I've done my calling. I've, I've completed my task. I have served the Lord as a watchman. I've been faithful. I have not run away like a hireling, which is exactly what Jesus explains to describe the difference between his self-sacrificial ministry versus the guy who's just there for a moment and then he runs away when there's danger. Humility, boldness, solemnity, selflessness, and finally, guardianship. This is what Paul says in verse, verses 28 through 32. He says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. 
Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul was a faithful watchman. He sought out to guard the flock and in carrying out that duty, duty faithfully, he now gives that same discharge to the elders that remain. And he warns them. He warns them that after his departure, they're going to have trouble. They're going to have men who are even going to rise up from within their own midst in order to steal away the disciples. Wolves, he calls them. This is war. You know, if we think of our Christian life and ministry and the gospel ministry in any other terms, then we are not really understanding our context of life. And that's what I love about Paul. He was a faithful soldier. You know, I think that there's a great danger in your listening to this sermon here this morning. In hearing this message, I fear that you may look at it and say, well, that's for pastors. It is, but it's not just for pastors. You say, well, what are you saying? Well, obviously, not not all are called to be preachers and not all are called to be evangelists. and Just like Paul, but mark this. We are called, and Paul even enjoins the church at Corinth to imitate him as he followed Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, right? We are called to, as pastors, to be examples among the flock. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 5. He says, becoming examples among the fold or the flock of God. Why? So that people would imitate godliness. So that people would imitate character qualities like what we're seeing in the Apostle Paul. Here's the great danger that I would suspect that you may have in hearing a message like this that you would just say well I'm going to put this in this is for pastor's file folder stick it in the drawer and then shut it don't do that let me warn you not to do that because I would submit to you that if you go through these character qualities of humility and boldness in the spirit and the solemnity of gospel preaching and the selflessness that we see in Paul and the guardianship that he had for the church, mark this, every Christian should have that at some level. All of us should be growing in these character qualities because to the extent that we see these qualities in Paul, what can we say? That these are the imitations of Jesus Christ himself, who is the quintessential example of all of these things. So this is for pastors, but it's also for you. And by the way, husbands and fathers, this is for you too. You are called to be the shepherds of your household. You are called to solemnly bring the gospel to your home. You are called to give godly, loving warnings to your children in the scriptures. And mark this, should you fail to do that, the blood guilt of that failure will be upon you. This isn't just for pastors. Don't Walk away from this message thinking that it is. Our desire should be, whether pastor or any other vocation in life, if we're Christians, our desire should be, the Lord, make me more like this man. To the extent that I look at these character qualities and say, you know what, he's, he's, he's like Jesus, and to the extent that I can say, you know what, these character qualities are the things that should be in my life too, may I grow in them. That should be our petition. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, I have to change everything up now and say that none of this applies to you except to say that this can only be your life and your hope and your pathway if you cry out to Christ and give your life to him through faith in him. Treadmill religion is a dead end. You can't get to heaven by doing good enough. You could never do good enough. Only Christ can save you. 
his perfection, his righteousness, his sacrifice on the cross, his substitution in our place, his bearing our sin, his enduring the wrath of God on our behalf. All of this is the, is the sinner's only hope, is to cry out to him and say, Lord, save me, forgive me of my sins. You are the Savior. I can't save myself. If you've not done that this morning, I plead with you, I solemnly plead with you, cry out to Christ. Because what hangs in the balance is heaven and hell, and it is eternal, and no, there is no second chance. And if you're, not, if you're in question of that, listen to the preaching and the proclamation of the rich man in hell who wanted so much for preachers to go out and solemnly testify about this message of Christ. That's how serious this is. It's more serious than we can fully understand. Will you pray with me? Precious Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the beautiful example of the Apostle Paul. And thank you for his endurance in the gospel. Lord, as we look at these character qualities of Paul, may it never be that we would just file these away and say, well, he was a preacher and he was an evangelist and he had these unique callings and this unique ministry. Yes, he did, but the character qualities that we have been seeing are really the character qualities of Christ. And nearly all of it is that which we're all to imitate and reflect. So, Lord, we pray, I pray, that these qualities would be in our own lives, that we would be more like Jesus as we look to imitate the example of this apostle who was a mere man. He was a vessel of grace. His sin was great, but your grace, which abounded, was far greater. He understood that principle. Help us to understand that principle. And as well, Lord, if there are any here who have yet to cry out to Christ for salvation, Lord, I pray, turn their hearts to Jesus. Open their eyes, remove the scales, help them to see and understand that everything, everything hinges on this question of whether or not they are going to bow the knee to Christ and place their faith in him or reject him. There is no third option. Lord, I pray by the work of the Spirit, turn their hearts, turn them to Christ and be glorified through their salvation, that they would even cry out to him here this morning. Lord, as we go out, help us to consider these things and to remember that your grace is sufficient, even as we're about to sing. Help us to boast in your power and in your grace. And may we boast well in this world that needs to hear this solemn message of the grace and the power of Jesus Christ who saves sinners, those who come to him. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.